Hey, what's going on, Wellspring? Welcome to Church at Home this week. Hope you're all doing well and you're all staying safe. And for those of you who don't know, I'm Pastor Joel. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. So if you happen to be checking us out for the first time this morning, just want to extend a special welcome to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey Church, just one quick announcement before we get moving on this morning. And that's just a quick reminder of our live uh, Q&A with our elders board immediately following our church at home service this morning at 11 a.m. Now the link for this live Q&A was sent to you in our weekly connection email. So make sure you log in right at 11 because this is an event that you do not want to miss. Well, churches, I just want to encourage you just to grab a Bible or a device with you and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Just want to read a a quick scripture as we transition now uh, into a time of, of, of worship. Just want to read two very familiar but powerful verses of scripture. In verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In verse 2, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And the little phrase in there that kind of stuck out to me is the three words, looking to Jesus. And church, I don't know where you're at this week, whether you're on the mountaintop or whether you're in the valley or somewhere in between, but all of us, no matter where we are, we always always got to be looking to Jesus for everything. He's our sustenance. He's our our hope. He's our joy. He's our love. He's everything that we need to live this life. And so I encourage you right now, as we just uh, enter into a time of worship, that you would just do everything you can to kind of zone out, turn your affection, and to turn your attention towards Jesus right now as we sing to him through song. Let's pray. So Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are and what you've done. And Jesus, right now, we just, we just choose to look to you. And we choose to adore you and to honor you and to worship you and to magnify you and to extol you. We choose to, right now to, to lift you up, God, in our hearts. And I pray, God, that you would just breathe in each one of our houses right now, God, just a, a freedom to worship to worship the person of Jesus Christ. And God, I just ask right now that you just fill our hearts with just a sense of your joy and your presence and your peace. As we right now declare to you through song how amazing you are. So Jesus, we choose right now over these next few moments to look to you and to worship you with everything that we got. It's for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Church, let's worship together.
you. We just want to make it our prayer and our declaration this morning that we don't want to let creation cry out to you in our place, Lord. We want you to use our hearts and our words and just our whole being to give you the praise and glory you deserve. We just ask this morning that you make us your vessels of your love and your joy and your peace and your goodness, God. That you would use us to give you praise and worship, Lord, and use us to amplify Christ to those around us. Amen. In the crushing, in the pressing, oh, you are making
God, we're just thankful that you're breaking new ground in our lives as we pray and worship and just bring our hearts to you today. Lord, I just want to take a moment just to pray for all of our young people. I thank you, Lord, for our young adults. And we just want to pray for them today that you would uh, just be their provision. You would give them jobs as they seek out opportunities, God, to work this summer. Lord, we pray for our high school students and, uh, and all of our kids actually in school, Lord, who just found out they're not returning. And I'm sure for some that's really great news, but for others that may be really sad. And we just want to pray for our young people today, God, that they would put all their hope in you and they would look to you. And, uh, and God, just would you comfort our families today as they just keep trusting you in this season of uh, homeschooling and all the rest of it. But Lord, we just thank you that you're meeting us, you're meeting our needs, and you're breaking new ground in our lives using all circumstances for the good of those who love you. And so Jesus, we just thank you for that today. And we thank you for your word that we now turn to. And we pray that through uh, what we read today, we would continue to be transformed to be more and more like you, Jesus. And in the center of your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I really believe that this season of COVID-19 that we're in is really being used of God to break kind of new ground in, in our life with him and our thinking. You know, COVID-19 has forced us to approach so many things differently and, and re-look at things in our life in so many different ways, from the way we shop to how we're schooling our kids these days to how we're going about work to what we're doing for recreation and fun, how we're thinking about our summer vacation plans. COVID-19 has forced us to relook at just about everything, it seems, these days. And COVID-19 has even forced us to relook at the way we're approaching church. And I'm kind of excited about that because I really believe that God wants us to renew and sharpen our thinking about what it means to be his people, what it means to be the body of Christ, what it means to be the church. Our passage today is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10, where the apostle Peter reveals three foundational things about what it means to be the church to be a part of God's people. We're picking up where we left off a couple of weeks ago as we're continuing on in our series, uh, Living for Christ in Every Season. You know, Peter's original audience as he wrote this letter of 1 Peter were believers who were scattered through five ancient centers in what is today now modern Turkey. They were the cities of Pontus and Galatius, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And these new believers were feeling scattered, probably a little disconnected. And Peter was writing to them to remind them of who they were, and the purpose to which God called them to. And they were probably a little bit like you and I right now, feeling scattered, a little bit disconnected, and in need of being reminded of who we are and the purpose to which God has called us. And what we're going to see in Peter's words today is that Christianity, following Jesus, being the church, isn't about a building. It's not about an 11 a.m. on Sunday morning worship service or 10 a.m. or programs. It's first and foremost, about a relationship, a relationship with Jesus. And second, it's about being a community, about being a group of people that God has drawn to himself and connected with one another to be seeking him, who's founded on and centered on Jesus. And third, it's not only about a relationship and about being a community, it's about taking up the mission of Jesus. You know, in this passage, as we read uh, about these three things, it's about relationship, it's about being a community, and it's about mission. It's sort of Peter's way of saying, this is us. This is who we are as followers of Jesus. This is the life that, that he's called us to. Even if you feel scattered, even if you feel disconnected or spread out or physically distanced like we are with COVID-19, this is us. This is who we are. And so I want to just take a few moments with you today to unpack Peter's words about who we are, who, we've called to, who we're called to be, and what we're called to be about as God's people, as the church. And so we're going to move now from looking at Peter's words in chapter 1 about being spiritually reborn to following him now into chapter 2, where he talks about you and I being living stones who are being made into a spiritual house for God's presence. And so if you haven't already, grab your Bible and turn to this first this book of First Peter, it's near the end of the New Testament to chapter 2, and I invite you to follow along in your own Bible as I read the passage for us, starting with verses 4 and 5. Peter writes this, he says, as you come to him, and he's speaking to hear about Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
You know, in these first two verses of our passage today, the first thing that Peter reminds us is that Christianity is about a person. Peter opens by calling Jesus the living stone. Being a follower of Jesus isn't about coming to a steepled building on a certain day of a week or giving mental assent to certain beliefs or being part of a grand tradition or even trying to be a better person. It's about a person. It's about a relationship with Jesus. It's about him. Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone, Peter calls Jesus a living stone, One who is rejected by humans when he came, but chosen by God and precious to him. You know, stones are typically inanimate objects. Although in the 70s, there was a time when people were adopting rocks as pets. I don't know if some of you remember that. The 70s were kind of a strange time. I was born in the 70s. I can say that. But Peter says that this stone was living. You see, up until the time of Jesus, people were accustomed to finding God and relating to God by coming to a temple made of stone, cut by human hands. But now, Peter says, we come to God by coming to a person, this living stone, Jesus. You know, in other parts of the New Testament, Jesus is called the living bread that has come down from heaven, who gives us the living water of his spirit, who sacrificed on the cross, the book of Hebrews says in the New Testament, opened up a new and living way for us to have relationship with God. That living way being the person of Jesus. You know, Jesus, Jesus is not an idea. He's not a philosophy. He's not an image from history. He's not a made-up figure. He's not a religion. He's not a system of rituals or beliefs. He's not a tradition. He's a living person who wants you to come to him. You know, it was this same Peter who wrote this letter who stood up on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts to tell everyone that even though Jesus had been crucified, and put to death, he was alive. In the power of God, Jesus had been raised back to life. And in being newly filled with the Holy Spirit, the book of Acts says, Peter said, God has raised this Jesus, this living stone, to life. And we are all witnesses of it. And therefore, let all be assured of this, that God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, Lord and Savior. Peter saying, Jesus is the living stone He was rejected by men, but precious to God. Jesus is the one that Peter is pointing us to. Christianity is about having a relationship with this risen Lord and Savior, this Messiah sent by God for us, who was initially rejected by men. He's the living stone that Peter is pointing you and I to today. You know, further down in our passage, Peter quotes the words of the prophet Isaiah, who predicted the coming of God's Messiah, saying, See, I lay a stone in Zion, Zion being another name for Jerusalem, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. I don't know a ton about building, but what I have learned is that a cornerstone is the first stone set in the construction of a building, or at least the way they used to do it. All the other stones are set in reference to that cornerstone. That cornerstone, that first stone set, determines the position of the entire structure in the building. In Jesus, God was doing a new thing. No longer did God want people to approach him through a temple constructed by human hands, through rules and regulations and traditions, though God set those very things up and used them for a time to help people see his importance, the centrality of of us needing to know him and his holiness. But God's ultimate desire has always been for us to know him in person, for us to have an intimate relationship with him. It was never for us to approach him as a tradition or a a religion or for us to relate to him through a building or through a, a religious service, to confine our relationship to him to one hour on Sundays. God's heart has always been for us to come to him as you would come to any other person, for you to seek him, for you to have relationship with him out of his great love for you and for me. You know, notice that when Isaiah prophesied that God would one day lay a new stone, a new foundation, a new way of knowing him to replace the existing temple, Isaiah said it would be a person, not a new building, not a new regulation, not a new tradition, a person. And Peter reminds us with Isaiah's words that those who trust in this person, this one, 
in whom God is sent for you to have a relationship with will never be put to shame. You see, the cornerstone of Christianity is not a creed, but a person having a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. Peter says it's all about coming to Him. It's not knowing about Jesus, although that's good. It's knowing Jesus personally in relationship with Him. As you bring your heart to Him, as you pursue Him, as you get to know Him through His Word, as you learn to believe in Him and rely on the leading of His Spirit, as you come to Him with the eyes of faith. You know, when Jesus first came, when He came in the flesh, the religious leaders of the day rejected Him because they couldn't get their heads around the idea that God would come as a person, that God would, would wrap himself in human flesh, that God would make himself known to us in such a way that we could, we could recognize him and see him and see his heart and then offer his life as the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. Those who rejected Jesus, the religious leaders of the day, they wanted to keep approaching God as, as a religion, as a building, as a service, through rules and regulations. They wanted to know God at a distance. But as Peter reminds us in quoting Psalm 118, a few verses down, he says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the new foundation, the center of what it means to know God and to have his salvation in your life. Jesus came to cut through all the barriers that we've set up in religion, that we might relate to him as a person Jesus came to be a new and living way for us to come to God. You know, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said that whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And what Jesus was saying in those words was, whoever has seen me, who's ever begun to get to know me, has seen God, has become to get to know God because he is God in human flesh who came to lay his life down, to pay for our sin, to reveal the love of the Father, and to give us a new and intimate relationship with God, to know God on a level that no other generation previously was invited to know God. You know, Peter says that it is as you come to him that all the things that God wants to do in your life come to pass. It's when you come to Jesus, that first time that God forgives your sin, he wipes the record of your sin clean and counts it against you no more. It's as you come to Jesus that God meets you in a personal way and begins to fill you with the Holy Spirit. It's as you come to Jesus with the problems of your life that you begin to discover God's answers for your life. It's as you come to Jesus in obedience to his commands that you receive God's peace. It's as you come to Jesus to offer up your life as a a sacrifice in loving God back that God's plans for your life begin to take shape. Christianity is all about a relationship And it's not, Peter doesn't say since you came. He says, as you come. It's an ongoing thing. Jesus wants an ongoing relationship with you as you keep coming to him. After talking about Jesus being the living stone, Peter then shifts to talking about us. And this is the second thing that I want to point out today about what it means to be the church, to be God's people. In verse 5, Peter says, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. In some versions of the scripture, it says temple. Peter says that like Jesus, God considers each one of us to be a living stone that he is building upon for the spiritual house, the temple that he's building for himself. Jesus is the living stone. He's the cornerstone. There's no one like him. He's the the stone set first that all the rest of the other stones are fitted around. He's the foundation. He's the center. There is no one like him. Without him, there is no house. There is no relationship with God. He's the cornerstone. But even still, God says, I want you to be like my son. I consider you also a living stone. See, God's plan has always been to bring you into relationship with him and then make you part of his plan. And bringing you to himself, God's plan is to make you like Jesus, the living, the living stone. He wants you to become a living stone as well. He wants you to be like Jesus and then join him and be a part of the work of his kingdom. And that's what it means to be a living stone in the building of this spiritual house that God is constructing through his son. You know, a stone on its own is not particularly impressive. It's only when a stone is set in place with other stones to create a structure that it becomes useful and part of something that is 
truly great. You see, the picture that Peter is painting for us is that God's people, the church, in essence, is a community. It, it's, it's, it's not about individuals alone. It's about those individuals now being connected to the heart of God and through God's heart being connected to one another in what God is doing. You see, this house that Jesus is building and you and I being living stones is a collection of hand-picked stones that God is fitting together around the cornerstone of his son to be made not into a physical building, not into a human institution, but a, a spiritual temple for his presence for all eternity. That's the picture that Peter is giving us. You know, first and foremost, Christianity is about a person, about a relationship, about a relationship with Jesus. But second, it's about our connection and connectedness with one another, with other believers. It's about the church being a community of these living stones who are being fitted together for God's purposes and to be a place where God's presence is being made manifest in their life, in their hearts, in the gifts of the Spirit that He gives them to serve one another. You know, every believer, the Scripture said, is given the Holy Spirit, but it's only when we're together that we become a true temple for God's presence. You know, to the church in ancient Corinth, the Apostle Paul said, don't you realize that all of, all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you. And that word from the Apostle Paul about having the Holy Spirit and being in a temple was a collective word. It's, he says, all of you together in having the Holy Spirit are God's new temple. Paul reminds us that each believer has been given the precious presence of the Holy Spirit. But it's only when we're together, whether that's physically or or just even at the heart level, that we are truly God's temple, that we truly manifest His presence in the way that God wants us to when we're together, when we're together in heart, when we're together in unity. And we don't have to be physically together, but boy, that would be nice. See, the only way for an individual stone to become a temple is for it to be fitted in alignment with the cornerstone and to be set in its unique place within the structure that is being built. And so Peter's point is that the temple that God is building is a spirit-filled community of believers who are each finding their place out of their relationship with God, with one another, in serving His purposes and supporting one another with their gifts. You know, in our modern world, when a structure is made of bricks, the bricks are just about all the same. But in the ancient world, stones would be individually cut and shaped for their specific place in the structure that was being built. And as a living stone intended to, to play a part in God's kingdom, God has cut and shaped your life in a unique way, a way that's unique to you and the place that God wants you to be in serving Him in rubbing shoulders with other believers and helping them and in supporting them. And we see our cut and shape through the gifts He gives us through the particular passions that rise up in our heart when we grow in our walk with God, through the unique opportunities that God gives us, the people He puts us beside and connects us with in relationship to. You see, being the church is about having a relationship with Jesus. And second, it's about being a tight community where God's presence and love is felt and made manifest in all kinds of practical ways. The third thing that Peter shows us in this passage about what it means to be the church is that it's about living the mission of Jesus. It is about living every day with holy purpose. You know, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he said the reason he had come was to seek and to save the lost. We're lost when we don't know who Jesus is, when we've not embraced him as Lord and Savior of our lives. He's the only way to the Father. And in John's gospel, Jesus later said to his disciples, and by extension to you and I, those who've committed to following Jesus, that as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus extends the holy purpose that he came for to our lives, to take up his mission. That's what being a disciple of Jesus is all about. In our passage, Peter again gives a description that we find from the Old Testament. First, he talks about a temple, but now he talks about a royal priesthood. And so in verse 9, Peter writes, you now through Christ you living stones who have come to Jesus, you are a chosen people, just like the Israelites were. 
You are now God's chosen people through your faith in Jesus. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of Him, the one that you are in love with and have a relationship with, who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. You know, in the Old Testament, God chose the nation of Israel to have a special calling. And God centered His presence through the tabernacle in the center of their community, the temple. He had chosen the nation of Israel to have a special calling, to be set aside with His presence, to be a holy nation, to be a kingdom of priests, in order to be a light to the rest of the world, to point all the nations around them to the one true God. And God has now given that calling to the church through Jesus. You know, being the church is about coming to Jesus. It's about being a community centered on Jesus. And it's about taking up the mission of Jesus to point the nations of the world, all of our neighbors and loved ones, to the one true God who's found in Jesus Christ, the only way to the Father. You know, in writing this letter, Peter's aim was to renew and turn around the thinking of those he was writing. You know, instead of his original audience seeing themselves as scattered and, and maybe exiled and not fitting in with the culture around them, Peter wanted them to see that they are actually part of a very special chosen people that God was raising up for holy purpose. They are a part of a royal priesthood. Maybe they find themselves on the outside of culture. Maybe they feel like they're scattered. But Peter wants them to never forget that they are part of a royal priesthood. They are, are God's special possession in him coming to, in them, sorry, coming to him. Peter wants them to see that their lives have sacred purpose and a calling that is above and beyond their time of history, that's above and beyond their current challenges, that's above and beyond uh, the hard circumstances they were in. They were a part of a royal priesthood, and that is true of every single believer and if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a part of that grand royal priesthood that God has raised up to form a spiritual house for his presence. You know, to be royal is an extraordinary thing. It's to share in the status of the king. It's a special status you have, not by doing anything or achieving anything, but simply by being born. And in coming to Christ, a person is given royal status and being considered now an heir of Jesus a daughter or a son of the Most High God. And one chosen to be involved in the work of the King, in the work of His kingdom. You see, in being part of God's chosen people, in you coming to faith in Christ, you're God's special possession. He sees you as royalty. And He has set you aside for a holy purpose, the purpose of pointing others to Him. There is no other higher calling you could have in life than to point others to Jesus. It's, it's a royal status that you have as a believer to be able to witness and point to others the way to find God in Jesus Christ. The second part of that description, royal priesthood, is to be a priest. To be a priest is to represent God, to instruct others about God, to minister to others on God's behalf. And that's the mission of Jesus. That's the mission that he has given us, to point others to him, to minister to others in his name, to teach others about what it means to follow him. Christianity, being a follower of Jesus, being the church is about taking up the holy purpose of Jesus' mission to lead others to him. And that is your highest calling. And that is a calling God wants us to live out in every season of life with all the gifts and all the unique abilities that he's given us. It's the purpose to which he's called you and him. You know, I want to leave you with three takeaways today from this passage and from these words of Peter that we've been looking at and unpacking together about what it means to be the church. You know, the first takeaway is this. When you think about your life and you think about what you've got with God, have you got religion or have you got relationship? You know, with Jesus, are you pursuing religion or relationship? Christianity is first and foremost about a relationship. And Jesus wants you to know him. He wants you to know him in a close way. He wants you to have an intimate walk with him. He wants you to consider him to be your best friend. He doesn't want you just to know about him. He wants you to really know him. 
And you can begin today to know him more simply by taking a moment and saying, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to ask, Lord, that you just keep revealing your heart to me. And as I open your word and, and look to who you are to grow familiar with you, would you acquaint my heart with yours? And God will take you on that amazing journey of having intimate relationship with God. It's the one that he wants all of us to take. Jesus doesn't want you to know him at a distance. He doesn't want you to know him through secondhand experience of someone else. He wants you to know him personally. And that's his invitation to you today. The second takeaway I, I want to bring to you is this. Are you connected in community? Are you looking for ways that God wants you to be a part of his body? Are you connected and committed relationships with other believers so that they can pray for you? You can pray for them. They can sharpen you. You can sharpen them. You can use the gifts and the abilities and the resources God has given you to help them. You see, God has a place for you in his body. And he wants you to move into that place. He's arranged your life in such a way for you to bring about a, a unique contribution and a unique support to what he's building. And he's waiting for you to plug in. And if you've not yet committed to community here at Wellspring, I want to invite you to do that today by uh, just going to our website and going to our connect button and we will follow that up. Pastor Joel will follow that up by, make, by helping you become a part of one of our encounter groups. Encounter groups is the way at Wellspring we want to be connected in tight community. We're a community at large. We can all get together, but we want to be tight and coming together as small groups as well. And so I want to invite you to get connected to community because that's where God will use you in wonderful ways as you get close to people. And the final takeaway I want to leave with you today is are you taking up that holy purpose that you've been called to, the mission of Jesus, to introduce others to him? Have you been thinking about your neighbors, your loved ones, your family? Have you been, as a priest would, bringing them before God in your prayers and saying, God, would you make a way for them to know you? Would you open the eyes of their heart to see you? Have you been looking for opportunities to tell them about Jesus? Have you been asking God for courage to, to take that step? Maybe you've got a great relationship, but you've never brought God into the conversation. And, and Jesus is calling you to the holy purpose which you've called. It's the highest calling you have. It's, it's what it means to be part of that royal priesthood. And then to not only lead people to Jesus, but to keep on instructing them and encouraging them to become a fully devoted disciple of Jesus themselves. Church, that's the call. And so I want to call you to a renewed relationship with Jesus, a renewed commitment to community, even in the midst of COVID-19, and a renewed commitment to the Great Commission, to the holy purpose by which you've been called. God will give you divine appointments as you open your heart up to that. And so why don't you bow your heart with me and join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you that you sent your son Jesus, the living stone, to be a cornerstone for our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you've invited each one of us to one-to-one -to -one relationship with you. How incredible is that, that the God of the universe would come to us in human flesh so that we could have a relationship with him. And Lord Jesus, we just want to say we want to be in love with you. We don't want to know you from a distance. We want to we want to have an intimate and close walk with you. And so we're asking that by your spirit you'd come and invade our hearts, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts to see you all over again and help us to become best friends with you, Lord Jesus. That's what we're asking today. And second, Lord, we want to renew our commitment to your body, to the body of Christ. We want to be exactly fulfilling the role you have for us in your forever family. We want to use our gifts and our talents and our time. We want, to, we want to be there to support those Lord you put in our life. And so Jesus, would you give us a greater heart for others today? And would you help us see how you want us to serve one another in the building of your kingdom, in the building of this spiritual house that you're creating for all eternity? And Lord, today we also just want to bring to you our loved ones and our neighbors and those who have not yet believed, who have not yet come into your kingdom, who are not yet saved, Lord Jesus, we just want to ask that you would use us in their lives to bring them to you, however you see fit. God, just give us courage for that. Open up opportunities, Lord. Give us the words. 
Give us the heart. Lord, we want to be used of you. We want to lay hold of the holy purpose to which you've called us. We ask that you would do the thing in us that we cannot do for ourselves, which is to make us a a warrior for the kingdom who fearlessly shares the gospel in a loving and gracious way and uses our lives to point others to you. Jesus, we ask all of these things for your glory. And we thank you for the blessing of your hand being upon our lives. Amen.
receiving this blessing over you this morning.